Howdy, howdy guys, Bonchato here, and welcome to the Better Late Than Never edition of Monthly Builds, this time for October of 2018. In these videos, I show you the parts I'd use for gaming PCs at various budgets, and this month we'll be taking a look at $700, $1200, and $1800 PCs. To keep up with new prices and components, I put up a new video every month, so be sure to subscribe to stay up to date. Before we get to the builds, let's look at some PC industry news. The big thing, of course, was Nvidia's launch of the RTX 20 series graphics cards. The first wave of cards is made made up of the 2070, 2080, and 2080 Ti. And they're switching over from the GTX to RTX because of Nvidia's newfound love for ray tracing, which, by the way, still doesn't work that well. I've said this before and it's still true, ray tracing is incredibly difficult. We aren't anywhere near full, proper ray tracing in games, and we won't be anytime soon. But props to them for getting the ball rolling. Aside from that though, these cards are a pretty hefty step up in performance, and the 2080 Ti is the fastest GPU available today, period, by a pretty wide margin. That higher performance comes with higher prices though. The MSRP of the 2070 is $500, the 2080 is $700, and the 2080 Ti is $1,000. And those are just the suggested prices. Actual prices are running up to a few hundred dollars higher if you can even find them in stock. One big benefit of the 20 series cards being released is that added board manufacturers are desperately trying to get rid of 10 series stock, and prices are taking a bit of a nosedive in response to that. The mid-range cards of the new series, the 2060 and below, won't be released until 2019, and because of the pretty huge stock of 10 series cards remaining, don't expect that to happen early next year. Still on the Nvidia 20 series topic, EA DICE was originally very on board with Nvidia's ray tracing, but after actually testing it, realized ray tracing still runs like a dumpster fire. Shocking. They're reducing the performance impact of ray tracing caused by certain objects, but overall the game should still look roughly the same. And they aren't making massive changes, they're mostly just reducing the level of detail of objects that significantly impact performance when they're on screen. Maybe as time goes on and developers get more experience with ray tracing, we'll see better and more effective implementations. Maybe. Looking over at Team Blue, Intel decided to start manufacturing its H310C chipset on the 22 nanometer process rather than 14 nanometers because of an ongoing shortage. Honestly, this doesn't really have any effect on end users, but it is funny to see Intel constantly screwing up these days. On the positive side of news, Samsung announced they're going to reduce their projected output of DRAM in response to lower market expectations for the near future. I was kidding, that's not good news. Basically, Samsung is happy with how much money they're making after fixing prices. Uh, sorry high demand, and they're going to reduce their output in order to maintain those high prices. Now I have seen conflicting reports of the overall DRAM market, so it remains to be seen whether DRAM prices are going to decrease, increase, or stay the same. Honestly, at this point, all we can do is guess. Now from Microsoft, the Windows 10 October update got pulled after numerous user reports of some pretty severe issues with the patch. Some people were having problems with driver installation, some of them were crashing during driver install, and Microsoft even said that using an Intel audio device could cause excessive CPU usage and reduced battery life. Oh, and they were completely emptying out people's My Documents folder. Yep, hundreds of gigabytes of files were just poof, disappearing because of a glitch in the update. Some people shared their frustrations online of losing hundreds of gigabytes of files because of this update. Hopefully they had backups. But Microsoft pulled the update after learning of these issues in order to make a fix. Now with the news covered, let's get to the builds. First up, we'll take a look at the $700 build. For the CPU, I went with the Ryzen 5 2600. It's a 6-core, 12-thread CPU with boost up to 3.9 gigahertz. This is a very powerful mid-range processor and will cover just about anyone's gaming needs. Oh, and it's unlocked, so you can overclock it. The GPU is going to be an Aorus RX 580 from Gigabyte. It comes with a dual fan cooler, 4 gigabytes of memory, and a pretty sweet metal backplate. Now the RX 580 is a powerful enough card for most 1080p gaming, and with 4 gigs of memory, that's enough memory for just about any game today. The motherboard is going to be an ASUS B450M-A, which supports overclocking for the Ryzen 5 2600, and it comes with the two most important things when looking at inexpensive motherboards. It has four RAM slots and an M.2 SSD slot. For the memory, I picked Corsair's Vengeance 2 by 4 gigabyte kit, which is rated for 3000 megahertz. That's great for Ryzen processors since they're very dependent on memory speed. It also leaves two slots open on the motherboard to add more memory in the future. For the SSD, I went with Adata's XPG SX6000, which is a 128 gigabyte NVMe M.2 drive, so no wires to deal with and super fast read and write speeds. Perfect for a boot drive. For the hard drive, I went with West 
Western Digital's Blue One Terabyte, my longtime go-to for bulk storage. Power will come from Corsair's CX550M, which is a semi-modular power supply to make cable management much easier. It's also 80 plus bronze rated for efficiency and comes with a five-year warranty. Very nice for a cheaper power supply like this. Finally, for the case, I picked Thermaltake's Versa H18 Tempered Glass Edition, which comes with a full mesh front panel for better cooling, a power supply shroud to help hide cables, and it supports 240 millimeter and 280 millimeter radiators if you want to upgrade to liquid cooling in the future. The total for this build is $696 and will give you a very competent 1080p gaming experience and even work well for editing and streaming. Click the link in the description to pick up these parts for yourself. Next, we'll take a look at the $1,200 build. For the CPU, I went with Intel's Core i5-8600K, which has six cores and up to 4.3 gigahertz boost clock. Plus, it's unlocked, so it's ready to overclock. To help facilitate that overclocking, for the CPU cooler, I picked Arctic's Freezer 33 Esports 1, which supports up to a 200 watt TDP, and it has a wide fan speed range from 200 to 1800 RPM. This is one of the best compact tower coolers I've tested. Next, for the GPU, I went with Sapphire's Pulse RX Vega 56, which has eight gigabytes of memory, Sapphire's dual fan cooler, and a pretty sweet looking backplate. Now the Vega 56 is a very powerful graphics card, so it'll work well for 1440p gaming and even into 4K gaming. For the memory, I picked HyperX's Fury 2x8GB kit, which is rated for 2400 megahertz, but Intel CPUs aren't as dependent on memory speed. Plus, 16 gigabytes should last a very long time and allow for better use of productivity software, particularly video editing. For the SSD, I again went with Adata's XPG SX6000 drive, which is 128 gigabytes and NVMe M.2. Because it's an NVMe drive, it allows for much faster read and write speeds than SATA. Again, perfect for a boot drive. For bulk storage, I went with Western Digital's Blue One Terabyte, which allows plenty of room for games and software, and on top of that, it's really cheap. Power will come from Corsair's CX750, which is non-modular but has plenty of power to run the 8600K and Vega 56 overclock, and it's 80 plus bronze rated for efficiency and comes with a five-year warranty, so you won't have to worry about reliability. Finally, for the case, I picked Corsair's Carbide Spec 05, an ATX mid-tower with a tempered glass side panel. It has a minimalist exterior and can hold three hard drives and two SSDs, and has plenty of cable routing options to keep your build clean on the inside. The total for all these parts is just over budget at $1,208, and this system will have more than enough power for 1440p gaming or even lower end 4K gaming. Plus, if you're getting into streaming, this will be a very good setup. Click the link in the description to pick up these parts for yourself. Now for the last build, we'll be running on a budget of $1,800. For the CPU, I went with AMD's Ryzen 7 2700X, which is an eight core 16 thread beast. It supports a boost clock up to 4.3 gigahertz and comes with the Wraith Prism LED cooler. But in place of that, we'll be using the Scythe Fuma Revision B dual tower cooler, which is a big beastly cooler, but still easy to install. And it's the best air cooler I have ever tested. It'll offer a ton of head room for overclocking the 2700X. Next for the GPU, I went with an RTX 2070 from Gigabyte, their gaming OC model with a triple fan cooler. The RTX 2070 is one of the fastest GPUs available today, perfect for 4K gaming. It comes with eight gigabytes of memory, a metal backplate, and this one is overclocked from the factory. Now for the motherboard, I went with Gigabyte's X470 Aorus Ultra Gaming, which comes loaded with features. Multi-zone LED lighting, a heatsink for the M.2 SSD, large heatsinks for the VRM for overclocking stability, and plenty of system fan headers. For the memory, I picked G-Skill's Ripjaws 5 2x8 gigabyte kit, which is rated for 3200 megahertz, perfect for Ryzen processors. It also comes with black heat sinks to allow for some overclocking headroom to get even higher performance than stock. For the SSD, I went with Samsung's 960 Evo 500 gigabyte NVMe M.2 drive. 500 gigabytes offers plenty of room for a Windows install plus quite a few games and programs, and the 960 Evo is one of the fastest SSDs available today. For the hard drive, I went with Western Digital's Blue 4 terabyte drive, and at this budget, adding several terabytes of storage is basically a non-issue, and at 100 bucks, this 4 terabyte drive is well worth it to practically guarantee that unless you're doing a lot of 4K video work, you won't need to add more storage anytime soon. For the power supply, I went with Seasonic's Focus Plus Platinum 750. It's fully modular, 80 plus platinum, and a somewhat ridiculous 10-year warranty. It also has a hybrid fan mode that allows the fan to completely stop under low load, which can really help reduce idle noise. Finally, for the case, I went with Corsair's Crystal 570X RGB. This is a ridiculously over-the-top ATX mid-tower with four tempered glass panels, front, 
top, left, and right sides. It also comes with three 120mm RGB fans and an integrated RGB controller, plus extensive support for liquid coolers, including a 280mm or 360mm radiator up front. The total for all these parts is $1,788. Beyond a budget like this, you'll be well into diminishing returns, and at that point, it's really more about bragging rights. Beside that, you couldn't really build a faster system for gaming right now because the RTX 2080 and 2080 Ti, the only cards faster than the 2070, basically aren't in stock anywhere. If you want to get all these parts for yourself and build an ultra strong gaming PC, click the link in the description. So that's it for the October 2018 edition of Monthly Builds. If you're building a PC for the first time, welcome to the community and be sure to check out my step-by-step -step build guide to see how it's all done. That'll be linked in the description. If you're a veteran and just wanted to catch up, I hope these recommendations helped you. Hit subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified of new videos as soon as they're up. So guys, if you like this video, hit the like button if you want to see more, hit subscribe, and if you have any questions on any of these builds or the news, leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, I hope I helped, and I'll see you in the next video.